The title is? Joy in the Spirit. Joy in the Spirit. I've got a lot of joy this morning, having a chance to get back to do a little teaching. Thank you, Ken, for You're your, very welcome. your generosity, inviting uh, not only me, but Rick the next week, and then the following week will be Jimmy. We're all going to be dealing in talking from Romans chapter 8, and I'm having a, a pleasure looking at the first part today, uh, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 4, 1 through 4 of chapter 8. And Ken has divided it in two parts. Uh, first, the first two verses, one and two, no condemnation. And then the last two verses, Jesus paid it all. So it's a pretty exciting lesson we're looking forward to. Uh, some of you know that uh, in addition to teaching uh, the class uh, here on some Sundays, one Sunday a month, I go over to what was Chambrell and now it's Brookdale and help Linda Grimes. Most of you know Linda. Linda's kind of a, a chaplain there. She teaches a women's Bible class. She has prayer meetings. She has a <coughs> choir. And every Sunday at three o'clock, and I'm not sure they're not doing it right now, but in normal times, we have a, <coughs> a service at three o'clock from three to four. Linda's in charge of that. And she invites, well, the rest, same people come every month. Larry Davis is on the group and I go. And, and uh, one thing when I started there, uh, <clears throat> I thought, well, it's late in the afternoon. Maybe I better start with something humorous, a little story. And so I thought about some of the stories that Art Linkletter used. Remember Art Linkletter, some of you? Kids say the darndest thing. Well, along that line, let me share one of those. And I think I may have already shared it in my Sunday school class. So if I did, then just uh, you can listen anyway. Here's a story I shared with them. A little girl was talking to her teacher about whales. The teacher said it was physically impossible for a whale to swallow a human because even though it was very it was a very large mammal, its throat was very small. The girl started, <clears throat> stated that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. Irritated, the teacher reiterated what a whale could not swallow a human being. It was physically impossible. And the little girl said, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. And teacher said, what if Jonah went to hell. She said, then you ask him. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, the joy, title of the first part versus the first, uh, we're going to read the verses together now. Take a look at eight. Um, okay. I'm going to read the first, uh, let me read all four of them actually to start. Uh, we got one and two up there, okay. <clears throat> there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, <clears throat> not do we, uh, three and four, okay. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh <clears throat> in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, the first two verses have to do, as we said, with condemnation. Now, notice as we begin the verse, uh, now, therefore, and uh, uh, Jerry and I used to have a whole thing going. Every time we were in a meeting and somebody 
use the word therefore, we'd say one of us or the other, see what it's there for. And we go back and look. In this case, what is, what is it there for? It's there to go back to the previous uh, <coughs> uh, things that Paul had to learn along the way. <coughs> Let me move something here. <laughs> I'll put this over here for a minute. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, the therefore refers, we said, back to uh, Paul's previous experience, particularly in verse 7. Uh, <clears throat> see what, uh, <clears throat> you remember, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> um, he went back to. Uh, <clears throat> And he said, uh, regarding the life lived in the freedom and the spirit versus a life lived under the law. Life under the law. <clears throat> now, uh, we have an online helper that has prints the material. And this time, uh, Dennis Parrott. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> My throat's a little... Thank you. Excuse me for a <laughs> minute. And his parent uh, has some, he decided to use the message Bible translation to help us understand some of these things. And he was looking at verses 7, 19 to 24. And <clears throat> life under the law produced a great frustration for Paul as revealed in Romans 7, 19 to 24. And then he starts to paraphrase from the message Bible. Verse 14, I can anticipate the response that is coming for I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not, I'm not spiritual. Is that also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself after all. I spent a long time in sin's prison. Sin's prison. <clears throat> Well, what's the problem with sin? Uh, where does sin come from, first of all? He goes back, Paul goes back to Adam. What happened with Adam? He sinned, didn't it? Was he the first to sin? Adam. Okay, he goes back to that point. And notice what the problem is with sin. What's in the middle of sin? The letter I, I, I. Uh, a couple of years ago, when um, <clears throat> Rick was teaching our course, he brought one day the words of Frank Sinatra song. I'll, I did it my way. You remember that song? Well, that's the experience of a lot of Christians. I'll do it my way. Sin, right in the middle. I, I, I. Remember the uh, poem Invictus says, I'm the captain of my soul. I'm the master of my destiny. Yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, there was a lady that wrote a parody that she changed and said, Christ is the captain of my soul. Christ is the master of my faith. And that's the way it ought to be, shouldn't it? That, that's the way it is. So you remember back in the early history of our country, uh, education. How were the children taught to read? They didn't have Dick and Jane back in the colonial days and so forth and with Spot and the things that we used to learn to read. But they had the old McGuffey reader, the McGuffey reader. And somebody wrote about the McGuffey reader. It taught millions to read, but not one to sin. Why didn't why did people why did not teach people to sin? <clears throat> because think about how it taught the alphabet. We we'll start A. A is for Adam, and in Adam's fall, we sin all. And that good theology to teach the youngster to start with, and that's what we get back to today in this particular thing. In Adam's fall, we sin all, and so that's. Was pointing out, he said, 
I was in sin's prison. I was bound. I was tied up by prison. And <clears throat> he went on to say, Paul went on to share his frustration with it because of this never-ending struggle uh, with sin. He said, uh, <clears throat> he said, I want to do the right thing. What happens? I do the wrong thing. I just can't get the victory. I, I, I. Then <clears throat> for um, the next quotation, uh, <clears throat> verse 17 in the Message Bible says, but I need something more, for I know the law, but still can't keep it. I can't keep the law. <clears throat> and if, if the power of sin within me keeps me sabotaging my best intention, I obviously need help. I realize I don't have what it takes. What hope do, do we have for help in this dilemma? I've tried everything, he said, and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope, and there is no one that can help me. And what did Paul, his conclusion in other versions, oh, wretched man that I am, what? Who will deliver me? He's come to the end of his rope. He needs help. I can't live this Christian life, he says. Did God ever intend for us to live the Christian life? Not really. God provided something else. What did he provide? And what was Paul looking for here? And he says, oh, wretched man, who will deliver me? What's the answer? Christ. Christ will deliver me. And the answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradiction where I want to serve God with all my heart, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally. He talks about a battle, a war taking place in the inner man. He wants to do right. That law, sin and death, puts him so that he's not able. And uh, <clears throat> he's pulled by this influence. And <clears throat> in chapter 8, uh, we'll discover what this like, how the help comes from Jesus. Thank God Jesus is there and he will do it. Now, let's look at verse 1 uh, <clears throat> again. Let me uh, come back here. There is uh, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, no condemnation. That was the title that uh, Ken had for this section. And why don't we have, why don't we have condemnation? Go back to uh, the whole thing about sin and uh, Adam. And then uh, looking at the law. And <clears throat> so what's his Paul, what's he realized right in the very beginning about uh, Adam? In Adam's fall, we sin all, that we're not able. There's no one who does righteous. There's no, not one, not one of us is able to do righteous, to keep God's law. And what happens as a result of that? There's a penalty for sin, isn't there? For the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. That's right. Death. <clears throat> so, he learns some very important things here. Ways of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Okay. And so <clears throat> he got to that point then, the whole th thing about the law. We're not able to do it, but Christ come and uh, send uh, as the only begotten son, able to... Re why was he able to redeem us from the law? Because he was sinless. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Now, back there, there's no condemnation now for those who are in Christ. Next week, uh, our lesson will be on what it means to be in Christ Jesus. But we know basically what that means, don't we, from our own experience. Uh, <clears throat> someone has said, 
we end of this chapter with no condemnation. We close the chapter with no separation. And in between, all things work together for good for those who love God. And we're, the three of us are going to talk about Romans 8, but nobody had that verse, so I thought I'd put it in here today. So that, uh, <laughs> that's where our joy comes from, isn't it? Knowing that. All things work together for good, according to God's plan. For He wants us to have faith. But he, <clears throat> when the law was given, did God expect the people to keep the law and get to heaven by the law? Just even keeping the law, did God expect us to be able to keep the law? No. What did he set up at the same time he gave the law? A system of sacrifice. Sin offerings were set up. Because we're not able to keep the law, he set up the sin offering to take away the sin, to take away the condemnation that we're talking about here. Uh, we're not able to do it, but the sinless Jesus, as we'll talk about in the next verse here, was able to. Now, <clears throat> uh, verse 2 for therefore the law of the Spirit and life in Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. Now we're talking about that. There's a new law then. Here was the old law, Ten Commandments. Were the Ten Commandments good? Yes, they were very good. But the problem wasn't with the Ten Commandments. It made life better for the people if they followed it. But nobody says could keep all the Ten Commandments. And Paul especially said, well, that's where I was, I was slain. I was slain by the knowledge that I could not live up to the law. I could not keep the law. No way. And he said that, that <clears throat> so what, what was sins, Paul said, he doesn't tell us exactly, but as he looked at the law, he realized, hey, Paul, a Pharisee, the Pharisee, trained in the law. He was an expert in the law, but he said, I could not keep the law. None of us could. All right, so for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. Paul said, sin shall not have dominion over you. There's a possibility you can, you can live a life without sin. Well, can, can we actually do that? I, I phrase it a little wrong here. No, we can't do that. We're not able to do it. But who could? Jesus Christ. Christ paid it all. Jesus paid it all. <clears throat> so, about this power. <clears throat> For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. And how did he do it? Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. What's the likeness of sinful flesh? When Jesus came, he came 100% God, 100% man. Complete. But what was the one difference? He did not sin. And there's always a discussion. Was he able to sin? Or was he able not to sin? You know, that, that discussion that uh, we had for a number of years. And... <clears throat> But he did not sin, therefore he was without spot, without blemish, an acceptable gift. He paid it all. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank God for that blood. Jesus was able to, there was that penalty sin somebody had to pay. We couldn't pay it. We had no means. We're just poor. And so Christ uh, paid that penalty for us. <clears throat> and then uh, <clears throat> go on to verse 3 now. We're talking about how Jesus says it all. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness. It looked like Jesus looked like everybody else, but he had the likeness of it. But the other part that was different from everybody else around him, he could not sin, and he did not sin. 
uh, Ken made the point somewhere along about the uh, proximity question about being near. If you were near Jesus, could you go to heaven just being near Jesus? Judas was near him, wasn't he? Did Judas go to heaven? No. <laughs> he had another fate waiting for him. So the nearness, and Ken raised the point about it's going to church. Is that is sure you're going to go to heaven? I heard him for uh, Oprah Winfrey on several occasions say that, oh, God is a God of love, and surely he wouldn't send anybody to hell. That was her philosophy. But is that what the Bible teaches? No. And so uh, we had to realize that Jesus did pay it. <clears throat> Okay, now verse 4. In order that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Uh, somebody, uh, one of the writers says he was glad that Paul didn't stop at Romans 7, never got to chapter 8, because we got some very important things. We add the Holy Spirit in the minute. Didn't have it in the verses, uh, and the chapters that precede it, but in this chapter we do. So, uh, <clears throat> the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Let me just read uh, that section from. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, the Living Bible, and, and just kind of review what we've gone through so far. Verses 1 through 4. So there is now no condemnation waiting for those who belong to Christ Jesus. For the power of life-giving spirit, and this power is mine through Jesus Christ, has freed me from the vicious circle of sin and death. The people of Israel just kept repeating sins. They couldn't uh, obey God when he said, obey the commandments. Even Adam and Eve couldn't obey the one commandment God gave them. They couldn't keep that. <clears throat> we are, aren't saved from sin's grasp by knowing the commandments of God because we can't and do not keep them. Yet God put into effect a different plan to save us. He sent his own son in the human body, like ours, except that ours are sinful and <clears throat> destroyed sin's control over us by giving himself a sacrifice for our sins. He was our sin offering, presented to the Father. His only son, Jesus, <clears throat> came to die to free us from sin. So now we can obey God's law if we are led by the Holy Spirit and no longer obey the old evil nature within us. It's still there, and we struggle with it as all of us know. <clears throat> I was talking a while ago about sin and I, I being the center. We need to take that eye out of there and twist it around, and when then what it becomes, not sin, but what we need is the Son. Be in Christ Jesus, which we're going to talk more about next week. <clears throat> um, we, um, uh, a few years ago, we were looking in uh, Hebrews 3 and 4, and I had a lesson one Sunday about entering our rest. That's a very important. And uh, <clears throat> confirm a real faith by obedience, trust and obey. You remember the song? And, and I like the song, I've anchored my soul in the heaven of rest to travel the wide seas no more. We're resting. And uh, Jesus promised, I have come <clears throat> that you may have life and what else? That you might have life more abundant. 
So Phyllis and I, from the time we were married, always wanted to find the abundant life, always wanting to find the best that God had for us. And that took us many places around the world and on search for the abundant life. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's what we need. We talked about Frank Sinatra's song, Doing It My Way. Now, remember uh, some examples of rest? Remember Jesus in the boat during the storm? He was able to sleep. And, <laughs> and uh, why? He, he, had per he could rest because he knew, what did he already tell him? We're going to the other side. If they had listened, to what Jesus was saying, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to know, rest upon his promise, thus know the Lord. And so that's part of Jesus' rest. Peter in prison could rest. They could be singing and resting. Uh, what's the hindrance to our rest? Uh, Hebrews 3.18 says, you don't have rest because of your unbelief. We have to believe. Remember the disciples in uh, John 6 come and say, Master, what is all the works you want us to do? And he says back to them, there's only one work that you can do. Believe. Believe. That's all the works that are really acceptable by Jesus. We need to enter our rest and uh, <clears throat> Somebody wrote these words after they read Hebrews 4.10. After years of struggling and striving, frustration and failure, a necessary step, I have finally ceased from my works and entered his rest. I used to work so hard at being a Christian. And as a result, God was at rest in my life, but now... I'm at rest, and he is at work. That ought to be a wonderful aim. If we do that, we'll find the real joy that we're talking about. <clears throat> uh, now, a few years ago, and in fact, along the time I was uh, looking at that, Charles Stanley came out with one, what's he written, about 100 books now? <laughs> this is one of Charles Stanley's books. Uh, <clears throat> the wonderful spirit-filled life. And he goes on to uh, talk about, let's see, page number here, about his experience. He had gone from uh, North Carolina to Ohio, and then finally down to <coughs> Atlanta, Georgia, First Baptist Church. And things were going very well at the church. Uh, and but he was on Wednesday night he was teaching the book of Galatians and he, <clears throat> he said uh, he got through chapter 2 and Galatians 2 were about you know uh, Christ in you the hope of glory and all uh, and then finally <clears throat> let me find where he talks about it here all right and then he, he said the two things weren't going so well People would come down the aisle every time he gave the invitation. And very often it was the same people. In fact, week after week when he gave an invitation. And he wasn't able to help them for some reason. He thought, well, there must be something lacking in my life that I'm not able to help him. Then on Wednesday nights, he was teaching. I said the book of Galatians, he got through part of it. And then he came to the point where let me see if I can find it here. <laughs> there was one problem. As I looked ahead to chapter 5, I realized that in a few weeks, I would arrive at the passage that described the fruit of the Spirit. How can I preach on the fruit of the Spirit when I don't see much fruit in my own life? He said. I thought to compound the problem, there were those verses just before it that described walking in the spirit. One more thing I knew nothing 
about. Here he was in the ministry many years. I, I don't know anything about this spirit. <clears throat> you have on the back of your lesson, leave all the names for the Holy Spirit. But there's one, and I talked to Gene about this, uh, they didn't put it down there, the Holy Ghost. And Gene said when, when he grew up, all the people around them talked about the Holy Ghost. We Baptists and wanted to avoid the Holy Ghost. There was something scary about the term. And, it kept, and that's probably what happened to him. But he said, uh, once again, my back was against the wall. <clears throat> I would be a little strange, it would be a little strange to skip the fifth chapter. And my conscience wouldn't uh, let me get up there and pretend to know something I didn't. So I started praying urgently, Lord, please open my eyes to the truth of what Paul is saying in these verses. Granted, my vocation was somewhat selfish. I didn't want to look like a fool. But at the same time, I knew I was desperately, and he said in parentheses, there's that word again, desperately, needed a change in my life. And I felt sure the truth I needed was in the fifth chapter of Galatians. If the Holy Spirit could produce patience, gentleness, self-control, I wanted in on that. So he talked about going out to one Saturday afternoon as he's struggling with his problem. And on his way out to his office out in the yard, he picked up the book. His wife had gone on a train trip a few weeks before. She sat, got back and said, Charles, I think you ought to read this book. I think it would be a help to you. But he left it on the table. But this day, as he goes out the office, determined he wasn't going to come back out of that office until he got the problem resolved. Even he had to resign from the ministry. He had to get the problem resolved. So he got down, he writes in his diary, had flat on the floor, and he prayed. And, and after a while, he picked up the book and his wife, ah, and it's a book called They Found the Secret. This one, one of our aunts and uncles in 1965 gave it to Phyllis and me as we were heading off to Africa, and we found it very enlightening. It's a story about 20 men and women who came to the same kind of crisis that Paul faced in his life when he said, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver they all come the same, these 20 people. And uh, so, <clears throat> I mean, and of course, the, the women are like Amy Carmichael, Frances Havergal, Eugenia Price, among the women included. Uh, but the book starts, the first chapter is about, <clears throat> it's called The Exchange Life. And uh, the one that, is, is featured in that particular chapter is Hudson Taylor. Have you heard of Hudson Taylor? Hudson Taylor was a missionary to China through China Inland Mission. And as, as he went along in his work and his ministry, he came to that same point that Charles Stanley came to, that Paul came to, realizing he's a I just can't live this Christian. I'm overburdened. I'm the head of the mission. They're giving me, and you've been there, you get to the point where all this is piling in on you, and suddenly you can't live the Christian life. And so he wrote to a friend uh, telling him about this, his difficulty and uh, how he was thinking about resigning as a missionary and going home, just giving it all up. And uh, he wrote to the friend John McCarthy, and McCarthy wrote back to him. <coughs> okay. Well, <coughs> uh, <coughs> now, uh, the author of this was uh, the president of Wheaton College, uh, Raymond Edmund. And uh, Billy Graham uh, was there with him and uh, uh, 
that actually did the funeral for the, the author of this book. But he too was a missionary. That's a story for another time. Anyways, he got, uh, <clears throat> so he started reading the, uh, uh, writing a letter to his friend about he might give up. The friend back to, you've come to just the right place. And this is good news. If you realize you can't live the Christian life, you come to a place that God wants you to be because you can't, we can't live the Christian life. We can't do it. God didn't intend for us to do it. He intended for us to turn it over to the Holy Spirit. Turn it over and let the Spirit guide you. And as Charles says, as he realized this, if that's the way he came to, uh, <clears throat> He said, when I finished reading the section of Hudson Taylor, I dropped to my knees there on that cold concrete floor and began to cry. I was so happy. Joy, we're talking about. I was so happy. I kept thinking, this is it. And then he went on to uh, go a little bit beyond that uh, <clears throat> portion. He came to the section where it talked about the vine and the branches of John 15. And uh, he said, um, <clears throat> he says, this is the vine. The vine does the work. The fruit is produced by the sap. He said he was trying to produce this in his own life. But can we produce the love, the joy, the peace? Can we produce the fruits of the spirit? No, we can't. Who produces it? The fruit of the spirit. So we have to have the Spirit of God working in our life for the fruit. And he says, it's the vine that does the work. The fruit is a product of the sap that runs from the vine into the branch. I couldn't get over the fact that the Holy Spirit was willing and able to produce through me the very fruit I had been trying so hard to produce in my life. It's not we produce it. He gets on talking about bearing fruit. I was on my knees for almost three hours just crying and thanking God for opening my eyes to this wonderful truth. When I got up there, I was a new man. Now, uh, the uh, us and Taylor calls it the exchange life, new life for all. I remember a couple of years ago, Clyde sang for us one Sunday morning a, a song. New life for old. I asked Clyde about that about a year ago, and he said, yeah, I still remember, and I still remember about the exchange life. It's this life more abundant. We can't do it. It's exchanging our life, letting the Holy Spirit take over in, our, in my life. Uh, all right. He said, I read and I saw, and I looked at Jesus, and when I saw, uh, oh, how the joy flowed. Talking about joy through the Holy Spirit. This was his experience there that day, the agony of the soul. And uh, so, okay. Anyway, that was his experience, and he went back. He was able to then teach about the uh, fruit of the spirit because he and he made a little chart in his book. Uh, he had several one chart with this a little chart <laughs> and it's a page of his book. And the vine is Christ. I am the branch. The Holy Spirit runs the vine. The sap. Oh, let me get that. I am the branch. The Holy Spirit is the sap that runs from the vine into the branches. The branches live, grows, and bear fruit, not by struggle and effort, but simply abiding. We need to abide, need to dwell in Christ Jesus. Okay, so... Got my bell. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that was the, uh, the 
<coughs> experience of Charles Stanley. And let me recommend the book to you. <coughs> now, uh, there are a lot of different titles for this. Uh, Hudson Taylor talked about the exchange life. Bringle talks about the cleansed life. Bunyan, John Bunyan talks about the unchained life. Amy Carmichael, the radiant life. Oswald Chamber, the highest life. Charles Finney, the powerful life. And Adonai Justin Gordon, the disciplined life. Richard Halverson, the burning life. Francis Riddle, Haverall, the overflowing life. Uh, John Hyde, Prang Hyde, the prevailing life. Dwight L. Moody, the dynamic life. Hanley Mule, the fragrant life. Andrew Murray, the abiding life. Robert Nichols, the satisfying life. William Nicholson, the soul winning life. Eugenia Price, the buoyant life. Charles Trumbull, the victorious life. Walter Wilson, the yielded life. John Allen Wood, the holy life. And Major Ian Thomas, the adventures like Phyllis and I had the uh, privilege of meeting with uh, the last one, Ian Thomas, when he came to Dallas for a meeting a few years ago. And he invited us over to the hotel to, to spend some time with him and discuss these things. He's talking about his adventurous life. Well, that's where we are. If you're looking to find real joy, uh, when I first came to Dallas as principal of the Dallas Christian School, the kids sang songs and when we had our chapel once a week. And one that I liked very much was the song, Jesus, Others, and You. Jesus, Others, and You. What a wonderful way to spell joy. Put yourself last and find real joy. You want joy in the Lord? Put yourself last and find real joy. Okay, so that's... Uh, a few things I wanted to share with you. Do you have some questions? Remember Paul in uh, Romans 12? I beseech you, brethren, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, whole, acceptable, and be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. And that was part of it here in the lesson today. The mind. We're going, the mindset. And Paul say, what was the mindset? You do. You keep the law. Do, do, do. You got work to do. And the other mindset was not because I have to, but because I want to. And that's what the Spirit offers a chance to want to do the thing that pleases the Lord. We can't do it in our own strength. We have to come to an end of self, find that exchange life where we got new life in Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit that lives in us and dwells within us. Ken, can I turn it back over to you? Or? Any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Um, I'm thinking through what's coming up. We do have the Thanksgiving dinner that will be, thank you, <laughs> that will be coming up uh, on November the 22nd. We're doing it entirely different this year than what we have done in the past. Uh, it will be an outdoor event. <coughs> Uh, there is no cost uh, because they're not going to do any kind of a, an entertainment or guest speaker or anything like that as it's sometimes been in the past. This is strictly a, a family dinner uh, for, the, uh, for our church family and for our guests. So the one thing we do ask is if you are planning to come, uh, please sign up. There is a sign-up sheet available here on the table if you want to do that or if you want to just contact the office sometime in the, this week or coming weeks. Uh, the food service committee just needs to have a number in mind so they know how many to prepare for. So uh, that event is coming up. Where will it be? Right Somewhere outside. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's going to be taken care of, but uh, tables and chairs are going to be set up for us. Uh, so I don't think you'd need to do that. But that'll be immediately after the morning worship service on the 22nd. 
any other announcements that y'all know about that we need to discuss? Well, if not, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for the reminder you have given us this morning about the importance of abiding in you, of allowing your spirit control in our lives. Help us, Father, to allow our minds to be reshaped by your spirit. Allow our lives to be transformed by the spirit's power. Help us, Father, to be open to your guidance, your direction, your leadership in our lives today and in all the days to come. Now, Father, we ask your blessings upon the worship service that follows. Pray, God, that you would just be with us, that you would prepare our hearts even now for the message you have for us. Lead us, guide us, make us more like Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> See y'all.